All right, first thing. Approximately 80% of the tests, 80% of the tests will be before 16 on Saturday. So I hope you're ready. Woo. That's what we call a bad joke. <laughs> you didn't like that joke, huh? All right. All right. No, when they work it out, about 5% is going to be after 1980, but they say there'll be no full essay questions or short answer questions from 1980 to now. Uh, there'll be maybe 5% from 1960 to 1980. The vast majority, about 80%, is supposed to be from 1776 to 19, or 1968. The vast majority, they say. Now, what is that? I don't even know what that means. Yeah, so basically, from the Declaration of Independence to the last little bit of the 60s. And that's what it's going to be. So there now, might be a whole lot on Vietnam. There might be a few. Because that fits in the 68. So there might be something about, if there's going to be a question, and I will talk about that in the review session, if the only ones that I have really covered in depth will be on the TED Offensive and the end of the war, which I will do right now in the review session. And then there might be a couple questions where they ask something about, you read something in the 50s, 60s, and they might say something about the 80s. But that is about it. For the most part, though, the questions are going to be on that. And when they ask you two essay questions, the, there will be two or three choices. I've seen two different versions of that. For your last essay, I don't have to sit back there. We might just have to pack people in. We can still desk from Mr. Fugars. Hmm? Carter, Mr. Carter's now down there. And there's nothing wrong with reading Mr. Carter's room. In fact, I enjoy skipping stuff on that. <laughs> but the point is, now it's a longer walk. So there's a convenience issue. Okay, so back. So, now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, now we need a desk for you. There's a desk right there. Are you sure? Yeah. Are we going to go get a desk from across all? Miss Brada doesn't mind. Right here. Hmm? <laughs> oh yeah, the, the essay questions, there should be one, the way, as, as I understand, there should be one that emphasizes before 1900 and one that emphasizes after 1900. And so the way that's probably going to be is something, you know, on the Industrial Revolution, the events that led to the Civil War, something about that, probably, maybe something of the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, but in that vein, and then something about press, progressives, the the twenties, the New Deal, up to the fifties and sixties. So that's what it should be on. And if there's something different, I'm just telling you what I read. You know, they they're evil. Those people who make the tests. Do you get choices on this? You get a couple choices for that. Only you have to do one. The DBQ, you get no choice. But that one is going to be broad. And so you should be able to find something you know out of that. And then the short answer question, same deal. It's going to be pretty basic. There'll be one probably 18th century, 19th, 18th, and probably three questions from you know like the 1800s to like 1940s, and then maybe one after. That's what it's supposed to be. 55 multiple choice. And just to remind you, I'll tell you the times you have again, just so you know, because I, it's exciting. I know you you will have exactly 55 minutes to do the multiple choice and 50 minutes to do the short answer. And to be honest with you, as I understand it, you get them both together, and so you have that total time to do it. And that's pretty good time. And then 15 minute planning period, and then uh, 55 minutes for the DBQ, 35 minutes for the other essay, but with the planning period, that's a lot of time to do those. 
Yes. Where you'll take the test? Yeah, probably on the roof. Yeah. Maybe in the hallway, right there in the middle of the hallway. That'd be a good place. Oh, that'd be awesome. Almost certainly in the career center, right by the counseling center, they can watch. Or that conference room that's right there, too. They can shut that down. It's pretty quiet. And. Do you guys want a desk? Okay. All right, yeah, well, that's good. Okay, any questions about the time? Do you know where you're going to meet? Bring 42 pins, 71 pencils. Bring money to, black, to bribe Mr. Furlicka. He will accept bribes. He's that way. He's, he is. He's just, I mean, he is just dishonest. Horrible. I'm broadcasting this one. <laughs> no, he's actually, we are very lucky that he's a counselor that does it. He's, he's, he's really good at this. Setting this up, this stuff I don't want to do. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what makes him good. All right, there's a couple things. When you do your DBQ, the DBQ, there's an important little bit of advice. Okay, they're going to give seven to eight documents. You must use six or seven. You must, and so that means approximately two per paragraph. And try to come up with good, you know, a good blueprint for each each paragraph and basically where you put a couple documents in each and then hip for each one and the big thing is something historical that relates to it if you're in doubt if it's about an era related to something historical historical and you'll be in good shape the other way to look at it is the intended audience the purpose or point of view why did that person believe this what about that person made him believe this? You know, why would Abraham Lincoln? Why would Abraham Lincoln be a member of the Republican Party? Because he was a free soiler. Something like that. Just why did they believe this? But when in doubt, put in historical, put something historical next to it. Now, you'd like to use different ones, but if you come up with two that it's basically the same thing, word a little differently and use it. Nowhere does it say, and I have not seen it, and I look, that you can't use the same historical one. As long as you're not just, you know, each one has the same one. But you can use it a couple times. Don't forget to document it. And also, for both essay and DBQ synthesis, related to something outside that time period. It's a great thing to do. Not only do you get a point for it, from it, but it impresses the person reading it. You've got to do that. Make them think this person is smart and put it in context with what's going on at the time. And just give as much information as you can. Oh, one more thing, answer the question. But if you're not quite sure part of the question, what should you do? Yeah, answer the question you wish it would be. Get as close as you can get. Give them an excuse to give you a good grade. Because they want to. I'm not kidding. They want to give everybody a good grade. Unless they're psychopaths and let's hope they grade hell on the highest. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, any questions? Last thing. Short answers. We've done about seven of them. And I want to give you a couple more. This is from the College Board. And this is what they're doing. What I said is why I like short answers. They're basically open they're basically open short IDs. So here's one of their examples. One of the fallout you clearly marks the beginning of the sectional crisis that led to the Civil War. Wow. You write a short ID on one of these three. Northwest Ordinance, no slavery, North the Ohio River. Do you want a desk? I'm good, thank you. Do you want a desk? Yeah, go on the hall and grab them. Stay out. Northwest Ordinance, done by the or I'm sorry, done by the Artists of the Confederation. It said that there'll be, it's pretty five states north of the Ohio River, and those five states above it will be free, therefore making eight states below slave. That's it. Missouri Compromise, sectional crisis to the set, um, senatorial balance and keep the number of slave states and free states equal. Missouri free, I'm sorry, Missouri slave, Maine, Maine free, 36 30. 
or Mexican territory, which led to the Mexican session, compromise of 1850, and so on. Two to three good sentences on that related to what's going on, and you've nailed it. And that's a pretty good one. Provide an example, so something that came out of the Mexican territory, the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Wilmot Proviso, the Fugitive Slave Law. So just, and then briefly explain one other option that's not useful to mark that. Now you look at that and think, what? Pick another one and go. That's all you got to do. Just pick two events and write about it. They're going to be like that, or in some version, it might give you a short paragraphs and then have the same kind of basic idea. For me, this paragraph about, let's say, compromise rate, you tell me about what happened. I'm going to give you another one. Let me not give you another one. Where are they? Okay, Lego cartoon. Here are poor people holding up the rich. See? And so, briefly explain the point of view about the economy expressed by the artist. What kind of point of view might you expect? Of? What's an example of something? What's a labor union at that time? What's another movement at that time? Yeah, the IWW, socialists. What's another one? Knights of Labor. That's it. Next question. Briefly say one development of the period 1865 to that could be used to support the point of view. What were those big entities created to only make money? Corporations. What were companies doing to keep unions out? Do you remember those things? Huh? Say it louder. Yeah, Pinkerton guards. What were those lists say no, um, no union members can join? Yellow dog contracts were the things that not allow union members to join. What was happening to the inequality of welfare in this time? What were both political parties? What did they believe? Yeah, the idea of social Darwinism and that. Even the philosophy of social Darwinism fits in there. So that proves it. Yeah, it seems like the rich are doing that. When development that could be used to challenge it. Yeah. So on these, do we need a sentence for each or full short idea? Yeah, about two to three sentences for each one. Two to three sentences. Next one. Really, it's one development from 1865 to 1910 that could be a challenges point of view. So, not quite yet. What's happening to society? What are people doing? What's growing at this time? Life expectancy is going up. People have more free time. Urbanization. What develops people out of the home now? Okay, well, yeah, electricity, electrical appliances. Life is getting better in some ways. The progressives were made up of what kind of people? So there's obviously a growing middle class that is benefiting from this era. So not everybody is this way. Now I gave you about four or five, you sit there and think about a few, and then just two, three sentences about it. And then you can write about what you feel the strongest about. In fact, they're broad, aren't they? They're going to be broad. They have to be because they're only giving you four. Okay, let's go ahead and review a little bit, then I'll come back to this. I want to answer some questions, then I'm going to go back and fill in a couple of the blanks that I missed. Sound good? And all of you have, now this is one thing that I hope you've been using. That review book I gave you has four practice exams. It have it must have a hundred short answer questions. It has let's see one DBQ for each unit, so they have nine. It has fourteen DBQs and thirteen DBQs in it, and then at least twenty other sample essays. They also have things samples of what they wrote to what it looked like or what the answer should look like. I don't think they're the greatest, but at least I'll let you look at them. So I hope you've been looking at that review book. Now that's something you have on your own. I'm getting some looks like, oh yeah, I've been using some like review book. I think it's somewhere in my room. It's a good review book for that. Okay, so 
questions, and then I'll go talk about little six and seven. Questions? Yes. 1914 and 1970, Mexico had a civil war. And that's on page 12, 13? 1914, Mexico, the Mexican Civil War. And the United States intervened in this civil war. So that's President Wilson intervened. And what he did is he sent, first off, the Navy attacked and for a short time took the city of Veracruz. And then in 1916, 1917, Wilson sent the cavalry to chase down Pancho Villa, who was a revolutionary but did a raid inside of New Mexico. And so the United States had a vested interest. They wanted a secure government that the U.S. business could prosper with. Oh, and relate to something else. The, in World War I, remember the Zimmerman note? Germany said, join the war. It was during this. Wow, they sent it. Well, the U.S. cavalry under Pershing were chasing Pancho Villa. Is there another one? Yes. The other one tariff that did it was a good bill for the free traders. It dropped the tariff to allow for competition, but replaced the revenue with the first income tax. Is it page thirteen? It's nineteen thirteen, right? That's under President Wilson. That's part of his reforms. And so the 16th Amendment allowed for an income tax, and so the underwear tariff would be the first income tax. It was it was low, it was progressive, so that basically only the very wealthy paid a small percentage. But in World War I, those rates were both dramatically in favor of one. Is there another one? Yes. Page 11, 1898 Hawaii. 1898 Hawaii. The United States annexed Hawaii in 1898. Because five years earlier, American businessmen led by uh, Stanford Dole removed Queen Lilu Kalani. Okay, let's say you write down Queen Lilu Kalani. What do you do? It is pretty much like it sounds Lily, then L U, Kalani. But if you're not trying to spell something, get it close. Don't say, I don't know how to spell this. Just get it close and move on. Whatever. But Queen, they removed Queen Lucalani because she wanted basically land reform. But, and so during this, and the US Navy helped. McKinley would annex it during this, right, during the euphoria of winning the Spanish American War. So another one. Yes. Yeah, Wilson was almost certainly the most racist president in American history, and, and that's saying a lot, you know, considering. And he showed this by bringing Jim Crow to the federal government. And so Jim Crow laws and segregated federal offices. So the Lincoln Memorial that was just built, just built before Lincoln or before Wilson became president, had, was segregated. The irony is just unreal. And it would remain segregated for the most part until Truman. Is there another one? Yes. The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911. Is that right? The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911. Page what? Page 12. Page 12. The worst industrial accident in American history. A fire started in essentially a sweatshop that was mostly young immigrant girls working and the owners locked all the doors because they didn't want union organizers to come in so they couldn't get out and over 120 or i'm sorry 140 were burned to death in the in that fire because they couldn't get out. It was eight stories up and they they couldn't get ladders up there they couldn't get out and this would really push or, 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 I'm sorry, really confirmed the progressive idea that we need regulations. And so the beginnings of regulation. It's really interesting as well. So three years ago, four years ago in Bangladesh, there was a fire at a sweatshop that made mostly clothes for Walmart, and 500 people died. It was very similar. So a lot bloody because there's a lot bigger factor. Yes? Same page 1920, 1970. 
depends on how this falls. Okay, 1920, the 19th Amendment, that would be us. It's also called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, and that allowed women, that gave women suffrage, the right to vote. And Alice Paul was the leader of that last push to get women's suffrage. He, she organized it, and she kept the pressure on during the war, when most of the time free speech was stifled. And she would be arrested underneath, uh, get my act right, the Espionage Act, and forced fed while in prison. But they basically held the moral high ground and finally got enough states to support it. Amazing person. Do another one. Yes. Socialists, anarchists, Marx, communists, and page 10. That's a small one. Socialists and the modern socialists, it comes out of the Industrial Revolution, out of the big class difference between those who have the capital and those who work, or the bourgeoisie and the, and the proletariat, capitalists and labor. And what they said, what socialists worry was, is that those who had the capital, because they get the profit, get all the wealth. And so what the socialists want, the workers to control the means of production. And more moderate socialists believe it should be through labor unions and regulation and some government control. But more radical socialists believe it's going to have to be revolution. And they're best known as communists. And then the most radical are anarchists who believe to achieve that, they got to blow the system up. And Karl Marx is the ideological, and also the, not just the ideological founder, but gives it the economic backing to, uh, to the socialist ideas with his communist manifesto, and also Das Kapital. And what he basically said is that workers are being exploited by owners. And they get exploited because of labor. He also came up with the boom bust cycle. That seemed to him confirm that capitalism is flawed. And so, oh, I should add, this is kind of a left, a, a left wing, because it's left on the political spectrum. A, a left um, idea that's opposite of laissez-faire capitalism. It's opposite, like saying, well, no, we have other choices. Okay, so another one. Or should I almost got like the IWW, Knights of Labor, they kind of are hinting that way. Eugene Debs was the leader of it. Yes. I got to go all the way back to 1493. The Columbian exchanges was given to the exchange of goods, ideas, bugs that went from the, uh, between the New World and the Old World. The Columbian Exchange should be right after Columbus, and the bit, and this is one of the big outcomes of Columbus arriving in just at a time when they could Europeans could exploit the New World, because from the New World Europeans got significant amount of food, not only just tomatoes and maize, but the big one are potatoes. Potatoes pretty much ended the threat of famine in the, in the Old World. Potatoes changed everything. To that darn blight, and. And from the old world to the new world, domesticated animals, wheat, and disease. And the disease would end up killing, we don't know, 98 to 99% of the people who live there, eventually. The glorious plague, as the Puritans called it. And I should add one more thing. This Columbian exchange would trigger globalization. An unprecedented, for the time, global trade that disrupted the entire world's economy, good and bad. Yeah, the climate change kind of the trigger that modern globalization. David Adam Yes. Yeah. Um, page nine. Nine? Yeah, panic of 1873. The panic of 1873, that was a massive panic, the, the biggest since 1837, well, bigger than 1837, so the biggest one up to then. That's what seemed to happen, each panic got worse. And once again, it was caused by over-speculation in railroads. But also, once again, by 1893, an effort to corner the gold market. And this was by Jay Gould, one of the robber barons. Over-speculation in gold. 
And this created a financial panic. Banks shut their doors. And within just a few months, a third of all businesses shut their doors. The panic was horrible. Unemployment in the cities, they never figured it out. It was just massive. And this is part of the reason, this panic, that the North would decide to abandon Reconstruction. We got our own problems. But this would directly lead, after three and a half years of hell, to the great upheaval which came out of the railroad strike of 1877 that looked like revolution. It started with a strike at the B&O Railroad. And it was put down aggressively by President Hayes. But it seemed to show that the United States, too, could have a class revolution. And that's why the, all you get these groups that the progressives all wanting to do regulation and reform. Another one. Yes. Perry in Japan. Did I answer that a couple times in review sessions? Tell you real fast. Commodore Perry for the U.S. opened up China. Or I'm sorry, Japan. Forced Japan to open up. They were basically not in, basically in their in isolation. And Japan made the decision to modernize because of Perry. Anyone has a question? Yes. Two more, then I'm going to go up to, I'm going to get Phil in a few things on this today. Yeah. The Redeemers and Bourbons are the old Southern elite who regained power in the Confederacy, in the states of the former Confederacy after Reconstruction. They're the old white elite that came in. And they called redeemers because they were redeeming their old way of life. And they're the ones who would establish the Jim Crow laws, the grandfather clause, would set up the laws to make sure that sharecropping was basically like slavery. Those were the redeemers. Bourbon's just another name that's more of a Louisiana term, same thing. And they're all Democrats because Lincoln was the party, or Lincoln was a Republican. So that's where you get this kind of weird thing. Yes. Um, 1869, Transcontinental Railroad, Central and Union Pacific, and United States. I feel like I talked about that one too before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just really quickly, they passed a law in 1862 to build Transcontinental Railroads. They got land grants, significant land grants and loans. Huge land grants. And the two railroads, one from the East Union Pacific and from the West Central Pacific. Yes. Mystic River, 1637, is that right? 36. Ah, sorry. The big thing about that one is, and I know I mentioned this before, but that's one of the big attacks in Boston, where Massachusetts, so the Puritans, did a sneak attack on a on a Wapanoag, a, Wap a Wapanoag, so a local tribe, and it sounds just like it, Wapanoag, you know. It was a kind of a fortified city, and they did a surprise attack and burned it down and massacred virtually everybody in the city. Basically, what they're doing is they're going to use terror to force everyone to leave. We have a name for it today. It's called ethnic cleansing, and that's what the Puritans did. Okay, do I have this? All right, I'll, re I'll review more a few, uh, a few of the other things, but I want everybody to go to page... 18. 18. And I'm going to pick out a few of these and go through them right now. Sound good? So if everybody looked down to 1866, because of the long, hot summers, those riots, a lot of, so look at, find the, da, 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 da. some of we did today, find black power. A lot, hmm? Did I say 18? Yeah. yeah. 1966. A lot of, of blacks, especially in northern cities, wanted more action. And they began to form the black power movement. And one of the big art parts about it is it's black consciousness. And this idea that because we are black does not make us bad. Black is good. This, the talk was black is beautiful. And the idea is they tried to go back to African culture. And that's back when all of a sudden people started wearing Afros. Before, most African-Americans tried to 
flatten their hair. The idea is there's nothing wrong with being black. We want positive role models because everything positive was white. In fact, every character on TV or movies was white, except for maybe somebody, I like told him. And Stolte Carmichael was the leader of this. And Carmichael started in SNCC and then came a very vocal leader. And boy, the FBI was after him his whole life. And he wanted more direct action. And following his advice, starting in Oakland, would be a more radical group called the Black Panthers. And the Black Panthers are going to take direct action. And it was because of the Black Panthers who started to arm themselves against police violence that you have the first modern gun control laws, starting in California to take weapons out of the hands of black men. I mean, that's, that's what it was. They weren't because of the Black Panthers. And so this, and this, a lot of whites said, see, look what happens. The governor who did that was Ronald Reagan. That was the governor, soon to be president. And then the e champion of gun rights. What small world we have. Next one down. We talk, I did Detroit today. Uh, one thing quickly about the peace movement and SDS, which is the Students for a Democratic Society. More and more mainstream college students and adults started going against the war. And it was 40% were against the war by 1967. But they were becoming a real issue because the vast majority of those who were opposed to the war were Democrats. And Johnson was a Democrat. In fact, the vast majority of the people who were opposed to the war loved the Great Society. They were just mad at Johnson for the war. And this is going to do a couple of things. Johnson is going to feel under a state of seat by his own party. Because you know, the, pe the people who are for the war are Republicans. And then the other thing is this. Republicans are going to use that. And soon, the Republicans are going to say the anti-war protesters are really against America. They're undermining America. They're stabbing us in the back. They're what? What's that? Say you said it. They're traitors. They're traitors. Now wait a second. They're traitors, and most of them are Democrats. What? Johnson is a traitor. Huh? Johnson is a traitor. Maybe not Johnson. Johnson's the wall, but Democrats are traitors. Democrats never figured out a way to deal with this. They're like, what? We're not. We're, we're bombing the hell out of them. You know, they couldn't figure it out. Really, they really couldn't figure it out. It has to be kind of funny in a very sad way. And so out of this is going to come a counterculture where partially because of the affluence of the 50s and 60s, more and more young Americans thought, I don't want to be stifled by the old culture. I am going to look for new ways. And some were very left. They taught communes. But the big thing is the counterculture that happened in Europe too, that's the kind of thing that happens to people who have money. It really is. When people have money, or at least think, you know, no matter what I do, I'm going to get a job. So I can do whatever I want. So if things don't work out, I can go do this. And that's going to become a problem because working people are going to look at the counterculture movement and say, you're a bunch of rich, spoiled kids in the counterculture. And that would be this file against these so-called hippies. Where does hippies come from? Because guys who are the beat generation, kind of into jazz, more berets, said so they're nothing but low-grade hipster doofuses. So, hippies. And in 1968 at Columbia University, it was kind of a culture of students of democratic society. It fits in there. Students took over Columbia. They just took it over. They were demanding now, some of the things were actually pretty good, I would argue. Some were just, you know, we're demanding stuff to demand stuff. And for days, it was a standoff. And finally, they said to the New York police, get them out. And they took their badges off. And they ran in there. Why take their badges off? No, they shot the clock. What's on the badge? Their ID number. And then beat the hell out of Why? Those spoiled, rotten, rich kids 
my sons in fighting in Vietnam while they protest. What person will take advantage of that? If you look down a little bit lower, you'll find him. His name, Richard Nixon. The master politician. Okay, moving on. The Tet Offensive. In 1968, the United States was claiming that they're winning the war. Winning, winning, winning. Why be in the tunnel? We're almost over. Johnson is trying to persuade it because there's an election year coming up. Now, they're killing a lot of Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, but they're not really winning. And then, January 31st, 1968, the Viet Cong, with some North Vietnamese help, did a massive surprise attack all over the South, attacking every single major city and almost every military base, hoping to trigger an uprising. This is called the Tet Offensive. It's because January 31st is the Tet New Year. They always had kind of an informal truce. Actually, it didn't totally fool the United States and the and North and South Vietnamese, but it was a shock. And for the most part, they were routed. The Viet Cong were routed. This is the best the South Vietnamese Army ever fought. The, Viet North, the North Vietnamese Army was um, destroyed in a city called Way. The Viet Cong was shattered, shattered. They were never able to fight again as a Viet Cong unit again. Destroyed them. This was the biggest U.S. victory of the war. Nobody believed it in the United States. Nobody believed it. They have been told that we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. And then what happens? They do a surprise attack. How can you do a surprise attack if we're winning? 40% of the American population was against the war going into 1968. Two months after the Tet Offensive, 40 only 40% now are for the war. 60% of the American public is against the war. Tet changed everything. Tactically, on the battlefield, the biggest U.S. and South Vietnamese victory of the war. Strategic, it ended the war. It ended the war for North Vietnam and the Viet Cong won a huge victory. Because after that, there is no way the United States can stay in this war any longer. President Johnson dropped out of the election after the Ted Offensive. He won the biggest election in history four years earlier, and now he had to drop out. It's absolutely remarkable what happened. That is literally like the giant being taken down. Ted was huge. And so because Johnson bailed out of the election, now there's a scramble. Who's going to get the election? Who's going to get the election? And what it looks like, it's basically between three people after Johnson bailed out. A guy by the name of Eugene McCarthy ran as an anti-war candidate from Minnesota, clean gene. He had a bunch of people who had really long hair, not start to become the style, and so he had them all cut, cut their hair short and wear ties. So they're um, clean, um, committed. So they all could be like clean gene, they also called them Jesus freaks. 68 was a weird year. But, he was, was anti-war, pure anti-war. And then Johnson's worst nightmare, Robert Kennedy came in, implying ending the war. And Kennedy got a burst of emotion when he heard the race. And the other one who had the establishment was the Vice President, Hubert Horatio Humphrey. And then what happened was this. On April 4th, 1968, King was assassinated. King was in Memphis, Tennessee, he was in Memphis to give a speech. Well, no, not to give a speech. No, I'm sorry. He was in Memphis, Tennessee to support a strike by garbage workers. He felt it was duty. He was very pro-union. He had planned on a poor person's march of 500,000 to march on, on Washington, D.C. for reduction of poverty. And I will show you this. What's it about? You ever seen this? These are men walking, and they all have eye of a man. Anyone see this? You ever seen that before? And it says, I am a man. They're wearing placards. And people just got to generically say that's civil rights. No. Those are striking garbage workers who are getting paid almost nothing and treated worse than dirt. And King was there to support their strike. He was assassinated by James Earl Ray, who would leave the country out of the Manhunt eventually be caught in London, England. 
after King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, the anger that brewed up because of this, that King was murdered, even though there was a lot of dissent against King, like the Black Consciousness Movement, there were riots all over, all over urban areas. Some of the most bloody, it was just like this rage. And a lot of whites said he deserved it. King was a troublemaker. He's almost like a cartoon character now. No, oh, he had a dream, it isn't it great? No. The man constantly lived in fear for his life, and he finally was assassinated. And he knew it in his last speech or something. The only place where there was a sizable population of African Americans that there wasn't a riot was in Indianapolis. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because Robert Kennedy was campaigning for president there. And while he was campaigning from the back of his car, he sat in the car, and he's shaking hands with people, he was told. And he announced it to the mostly black crowd. He told them, told them about his personal relationship, how much he admired King, and there was no riot. Why that's important, or why that fits in, two months later, Robert Kennedy would be assassinated after winning the California primary and potentially getting the Democratic nomination for president. It's one of the great whitest in history. Because if he would have had the nomination, he would have won. Humphrey probably should have won. He would have won. He was assassinated by a, a Palestinian refugee named, I kid you not, Sirhan Sirhan. And see, so, so you normally have three names. If you notice that, John Lord Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, James Earl Ray. If you can't have three names, let's just go with two of the same, Sirhan Sirhan. And he was mad at Kennedy's support of Israel. Seriously, that's what the reason was. And assassinated. He's still in prison in California today. Where was he from? Israel? He was a Palestinian refugee. And so he was somebody who his relative or he grew, he was born in Palestine, but had to go to a refugee camp when Israel was born. Yeah. Wait, were the riots because the black slot came to deserve to be No, no, no. They it was just rage basically saying that, you know. Whites will never let us have equal rights. It was just rage. A, a lot of whites said he deserved it. You ought to look at the interviews. It kind of it's, it makes me sad because really, I know it might seem like a long time ago. It really isn't long ago as time goes. Let me rephrase that. If it's in my lifetime, to me, it's not old. And it's in my lifetime. I was 46. <laughs> yes. Are these differences about Johnson and Johnson's re election? Oh, I don't know why, but LBJ drops off again. I didn't mean to. But you have the Democratic Convention. The 1968 Democratic Convention that was a free for all. Just crazy. 10,000 anti war protesters came. There were members of a kind of a hippie party called the Youth International Party. You might, I saw it above, I didn't mention them, called the Yippies. And they were going to protest. They protested, um, basically the the war because it was a democratic war. There were actually twice as many police officers and national guardmen than protesters. Not many came. And so, what happened was, in front of the convention hall, after the Hilton Hotel, they have a big hall in there. As they're nominating the president, there's a huge fight on the Democratic convention on whether or not they'll support the war or go for an anti-war plan. It's a major fight. While this is going on, there's street fighting out in the street. And what happened was, one of the protesters pulled down an American flag on the memorial for the Haymarket Square. Remember the Haymarket Affair in 1887? Pulled the flag down and put up a Viet Cong flag. And the police, do you know what they did? and went after them. They beat the hell out of them. It was a bloody mess. After it, it's going to be called a police riot. They hammered them. As we find out later, almost a third of the protesters were actually agents of the FBI and the CIA. And the person who did it was actually a CIA operative who was an agent provocateur, who was trying to get them beaten up. Yeah, almost a third 
cooperatives of the FBI. So the protesters. So the police would get pissed and beat the hell up. Why? To make the protesters look bad. All this stuff is going to come out. The secret government. Technically, that was illegal, but no one did. They had a name for it. It's called COINTEL, counterintelligence. Get it? All right, next one down. Oh, so almost forgot. Well, the Republicans had a very stale, dull, boring convention. Who would you rather have? The chaos at the Democratic convention? Stability. Oh, who did the Democrats nominate? They nominated HQ, Hubert Humphrey. And the Republicans nominated, he's back, the new, new Nixon, Richard Nixon. And Nixon played upon the fears of everybody in this election of 1968. He said he's going to unify the country, but he played on the silent Americans, those who were for America, but not out there protesting in the streets, not out there rioting. Yes. First question. What was illegal about the CIA putting up the What's illegal? It was illegal to use to um, have the CIA infiltrated a group in the United States. Right. That, yeah, the CIA cannot do that. They can only do things outside the border. And they can only, and if they do those kinds of things, an agent provocateur, that is illegal too because that's a trap. And then there's also issues about I don't know, warrants and that sort of thing. So Nixon and the Democrats split. George Wallace, the segregationist governor of, of uh, Alabama, jumped in the race. He's a Democrat. He jumped in. Now, he called himself the American Independent Party, but everyone, it's just like 1948, the States' Rights Party. And what was this program? Well, basically, had two things segregation, integration. We've given those people too many rights. That, and it's time to use the ultimate force in North Vietnam. If they won't come to the peace table, nuclear weapons. And he had a huge following. There'd be Confederate flags. His, his uh, placard was a Confederate battle flag, looked just like it, with his face in it. His running mate was Curtis LeMay, bombs away LeMay. Yeah, they openly talked about war. So Nixon's going, all they got to do is not screw up. I'm president. And then in October, Humphrey came out against the wall. Came out against his president, infuriating Johnson. He came out and said, Stop. He said, do, He wants peace talks. He wants legitimate peace talks. And everything changed. All of a sudden, it got tight. And then Lyndon Johnson announced a week before the election, peace talks in Paris. Humphrey's going to win. Humphrey is going to be the president. This is huge. And then, shocking everybody, South Vietnam pulled out of the peace talks, and Nixon won one of the closest elections in history. Because when they pulled out, that Humphrey lost his momentum. Razor thin margin. If Wallace wouldn't have, uh, if Wallace wouldn't have been the race, Humphrey probably would have won. But. Illegally, the FBI was bugging Nixon's campaign because that's what the FBI did. Nixon set it up through a complicated chain. He got to the president of South Vietnam. His name was T. T H I E U, and went to President Tu and said, "Get out of the peace talks, and I promise to support you forever." Tu got out of the peace talks. Nixon got elected president. The peace agreement, the working agreement that brought them together a week before the election was virtually identical, in fact, slightly better for the South than what was actually ratified in 1973. Yes? He only promised the support of the first like eight years now, right? Yeah, but you know, implied that we'll win. We'll have enough victory, you'll win. Nixon's plan was to keep the war going indefinitely. That was his plan. And here's the thing. 
28,000 Americans died from 19, from that time when they canceled, settled the peace agreement until the U.S. pulled out. Over 2 million Vietnamese died in that time. That is why I do not hide my hatred for one person, Richard Nixon. Because it could have a peace agreement, and if it would have been Humphrey, it would have happened in 69. And thousands would still be alive. So I don't like Richard Nixon. I know, and he's coming back. I know he died in 93, but that guy, you can't keep him down. <laughs> Nixon became president. Let me finish this a couple things real quick. And what Nixon did is, Nixon took advantage of the destruction of the Viet Cong at 10. He took the advantage. And what he did is, he did Vietnamization. He's going to turn the war over to the South Vietnamese. Try to make their army better. And actually, it looked like it was working because the Viet Cong was so decimated by Tet. But he also had something else. Most of the opposition against the war was because the draft was so unfair. The draft turned to a lottery. Therefore, it is much more fair. The draft boards would pick people. So they'd find people who are eligible. And at first, if you were in college, you could get out. If you're married, you could get out. If you're married with children, you could get out. But pretty soon they got rid of those. And the draft board could just pick people just because they don't like them. For example, the Memphis draft board hated Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion of the world, despised him. He changed his name from Cassius Clay. He was very outspoken and blacks aren't supposed to be that way. And so even though he was significantly older than the draft age, they drafted him out of spite. And he would become a conscientious objector, but he'd lose his title. Some of his best years as a boxer would be lost. So that's an example of what happened. He became a very vocal anti-war protester. Really intelligent man. And it's a good reason not to box. What happened to him? Anyone know? Got his head beat in. He got that caused Parkinson's disease. Just can't talk. This guy was just so intelligent, so vocal. I know some of you are thinking, I just want a box. He was a mean person. He was mean about the stuff like that he didn't like, I guess. And he was like, what? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, when I came to boxing, he was like a very aggressive person to like call out before he was boxing against. Like, yeah, he was like Floyd Mayweather basically when he came to boxing. No, he, he, he was. Uh, he, he actually boxed. He wasn't a white man. <laughs> <laughs> he actually boxed. And he didn't beat his wife. <laughs> 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 he was like, I don't like Floyd Mayweather. You know? he, was, he would like trash talk a lot. Oh, of course he would. Because it scared the crap out of people. <laughs> well, I'm not saying he's a perfect person just because he's intelligent. Yeah, otherwise, and yeah. Be bad. Like, how does that box him? Or didn't he, or even if he wasn't, they just drafted him because of change. All right, so the lottery became more equal. And so what it meant is basically if you were 19 and your number was high, everybody was their birthday was issued a number by everybody was issued a number by their birthday. Just a random number, one to 365. If your number was high, you're probably not gonna be drafted. So if you're not gonna be drafted, it's like woohoo! So you didn't protest. So it alleviated some of the pressure of the anti-war protests. And what they would do is they would say, okay, we need so many soldiers. So we'll say anybody with a number below 150 is in. Above 150 is not in. So if your random number is 300, you're probably safe. If you're 365, woohoo! Or as Mr. Sims, some of you might know him, but he used to teach here. He's up for me. He'll suffer for me next Friday because I'm not going to be here. CIA. Well, <laughs> I'm not Canada. They're Canada's. <laughs> Mr. Seal was going to call it at UM, it was in the TV lounge, and they would announce the numbers. They put it up on the TV, and that's how they did it, on the local network. And they put up the number, they, or they put up the birthdays and what number, and they're all watching, he's like, yes, you know, he's like 220 or something, or he's like 280, so he's fine. And he's going through it, and all of a sudden heard this, oh, shit. This <laughs> 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 guy's like... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back to this. And Nixon did everything he could to get the media to quit reporting on the wall. He basically 
threatened. He first off said, you got to put reporting on it because even though the news media was pro-war, the pictures were anti-war. Anything from the war was anti-war because it's horrible. And if they refused, then Nixon said, you're an enemy. And he got the IRS to audit them. He got the FBI to investigate them. He did everything he could to shut them up. He even put almost every reporter on a list. He called it the enemies list of everybody who he thought was out to get him. Nixon, by no means, was paranoid. Joe Namath was on that list. Yeah. Did he actually Yeah, well, he believed everybody was on Of course, John, he hated John Lennon with compassion. And part of Nixon's strategy was called New Federalism. And New Federalism implied turning over stuff to the states. But what really knew to give the states more power. So turn over government programs to the states. But in reality, what it was meant to do was to weaken the great society. So take focus programs and just dump money to the states. They call them block grants. It's no coincidence that new federalism would lead to police departments getting all this money because of crime. And units that frankly have no real use 99% of the time would be created like SWAT units. Or uh, they often start getting armored cars and tanks. Now we should know that because Halma has two armored cars. And as we all know, we need them because they look good in parades. So, and Nixon also locked down. Because in 1969, each president, when the U.S. landed, landed a man on the moon. Now, we know what really happened, right? It was in a sound stage in Arizona, correct? <laughs> Apollo 11. And so most Americans, well, the United States did not realize that the Soviets had pretty much abandoned it. But the U.S. landed on the moon. And it was unimaginable what a big deal this was. Who was the first man to walk on the moon? And Neil Armstrong, who? Lance <laughs> Armstrong, yeah. And Neil Armstrong had just passed away. Buzz Aldrin was second. And Buzz Aldrin, Buzz Aldrin, about five years ago, you got him, like 82. Somebody came into space and said, You didn't land on the moon. You didn't land on the moon. And he knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's been to hell. Yeah. I think he's like, like, oh, he's, he's an honorary cuss. But it was a big deal. But pretty soon after they landed the first time, now what? They planned nine missions to the moon. They would only do five. And one barely made it back to Earth. And the last one in 72. And I was obsessed by it. I, I just I, I was just obsessed by it. I draw pictures of it over and over again. I thought it was the most amazing thing. Uh, it's still, it's still just in awe of that. Was, was there any goal with that? Well, it's you know the technology to do it, but the big thing is we're going to get the moon for like thirty months. All right, so let's take a break, and then let's come back. Sound good? Went through a lot. And by the way, sorry I'm so small on this. I didn't get it. I'm really sorry. I blame Hannah. Why did you do this? Which one? Oh my goodness. We got two hands. In cahoots. Best show ever. <laughs> Boy. Who's hungry? Angela, you're going to cook this up for us? I almost want to open it up, but I don't want to ruin it. You know? I yeah, in fact, I uh, I talked to my stepfather who's huge in Washington. He was there. He actually was there and he said, right, no, I was gonna call you, but I didn't. Thanks, Daryl. I gotta I call you. I know I mean I say this, I should do that you get busy doing something else. But you know one of the guys. If he's gonna get in touch with we're gonna draw it. Okay. Okay, we'll see. Okay. Um, did you get enough out? Did, did it help? And then, um, yeah, if you have any questions, ask me. Oh, God. Okay. Isn't it great? We have about Vietnam and you go back to Pearl Harbor. Why would you do that? She's a special topic. We're working on this. She's doing it. She's doing it. She's doing it. Yeah, you have baseball after school. I don't know. Yeah, I'm yeah. 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 pretty happy.
Sorry, yeah, it's like 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 the problem is, and you know what, and you start getting heavy, what happens? Yeah, that's why I clean the food. Like, yeah. That's why yeah. I yeah. like that. I was like, 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 I but you don't need it for anything, you just want to work out the game chase well. That's my best advice I can <laughs> But the grass are they are
I will answer some questions and then I'll go back and do a few of the 70s. Sound good? Um, Chef Curry's the shop. Yes. Break the rest. What's that? Ours is great. No, ours my ankle playing basketball. Yes, ours my ankle playing basketball. What was I looking for? Well, you know, the thing about the Beatles. You have to know the names of them all, where they said, you know, growing up in Liverpool. Talk a little bit about that time when Lennon McCartney went to Paris in 1960. The Beatles, what they did basically is they revitalized rock and roll in the United States in 1964. Like, and, and, and the cultural phenomenon, they became a cultural phenomenon. We have to incorporate what are you doing? <laughs> 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 I dropped it. 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 I question? it. I dropped it. I dropped it. I No, it. I dropped it. I dropped it. I dropped it. I dropped is three pairs with that too? Boy, that's a big one. What I, and what I give you, like, one states? <laughs> the Southern strategy, what happened was, the British decided that they would go to the South where there was more loyalist feeling, and they and to try to make sure they got the, the Southern colonies, because the North was so radical. But what happened is, as they fought in the South, as they moved through the South, they made enemies by burning down homes, by taking food, and this created more patriots. And eventually, they were run out of the South. The battle was Guilford Courthouse, and Lord Cornwallis was defeated by Nathaniel Green, probably the best uh, general, I said Union general. But, real quickly then, so Cornwallis went into Virginia, and there in Virginia, it didn't work. And so he went to the coast and was surrounded by Washington at Yorktown. And at Yorktown, Cornwallis surrendered. And with that, the British decided they could no longer stay in the war. And that led to the Treaty of Paris of 18, I'm sorry, 1783. And in the Treaty of Paris of 1783, the United States won its independence. Yeah. So with the Southern strategy, is that the, the uh, where the Southerners were to act like loyalists mm -hmm. and attack British and hide in the swamps or whatever. Yeah, and that, that was Francis Mary in the swamps. Oh, yeah. The best known of that. Yeah, he would, you know, attack, hide in the swamp, or they'd attack, they'd go back to the farm and say, we love the British. That's, that was part of the Southern strategy. That was one of the, he's one of the gorillas that was created. Is there another one? Yes. Um, page 10, 1860, 1860, 1868, 1869, the 90. Okay, the Indian Wars, what I put it on there is basically the Plains Indian Wars, and this was the last stand for the Plains Indians. That they desperately tried to maintain their hunting ground. But when the railroads arrived, did you find it? And when the railroads came, that cut the buffalo herd in half, the transcontinentals, and brought the buffalo hunters. And so the Indians, the various tribes tried to fight back, and that is when the United States Army adopted total war. And what they did is, to force the Indians to go on reservations, they destroyed their food supply, meaning the army helped the buffalo hunters destroy the buffalo herds. And by the 1880s, they did. They completely destroyed them. And that forced the remnants, most died, to go on the reservations. And a couple examples of that would be two battles we, or three battles we'll mention. One was at Sand Creek, and that was in 1864 in Colorado. And that's when, same deal, protect buffalo herds. 
and a peaceful tribe in Colorado was attacked by militia out of Denver and massacred. And the reason we mention that is because there's kind of like Mystic River. So the tactics had not changed. Weapons had, but tactics had. And then the, the Battle of Little Bighorn, that would be a big victory for the Sioux, the Lakota, and the Cheyenne in Montana over the 7th Cavalry under Lieutenant Colonel George Custer. But when that happened, the United States decided gloves are off. They're going to destroy them. And that would spell the end. That humiliation after Little Bighorn, the United States ran every tribe, every group that refused to go to the reservations down and forced them on. And then, Wounded Knee is what happened when on these horrible reservations, uh, the Pine Ridge in South Dakota, where, <coughs> where the dance called the Ghost Dance started. Do you remember that dance? And many of the people thought it could be leading up to another Indian revolt. They tried to arrest Sitting Bull, and he would be shot. And a bunch of uh, uh, Lakota panicked, and they were run down by the 7th Cavalry, the same George Custer's old unit, and massacred at Wounded Knee. And that was a result of that. And that was kind of the culmination of the Indian. So we have that, and then right below, make sure you got the Dawes Act, they won't have that. You know, try to force the American Indians to become essentially like small farmers, give them a homestead. But what happened is almost all the land ended up going to whites. Half of all reservation lands whites. Yes, Amber? On the same page, gospel of wealth. Gospel of wealth. And that should be, is that near the top? <laughs> oh, gospel of wealth is kind of a form of social Darwinism. And that's Andrew Carnegie's idea. And what he believed was, sure, the wealthy should do whatever it takes to get rich. They're supposed to be rich. So he believed in social Darwinism. But then it's your duty as a extremely wealthy person, philanthropy, give it back, to find those other people who might get lost and not realize their potential. The idea was you'll build libraries or opera houses, try to prove your culture, and therefore, People on the bottom, they might be able to rise up like Carnegie did. And that kind of was a kind of hypocritical, like when he broke the Union Homestead, but his big social gospel thing was, I got more money, so I'll build you an opera house. Is there another one? Yes, Moon. Um, page 17, Feminine Mystique. Page 17, what? Feminine Mystique. Oh, the Feminine Mystique. Oh, my goodness. Everybody, please get to that. The Feminine Mystique is on page 17, and, geez, I, I thought I talked about it in class. Let me, oh, no, I'm going to make sure I talk about it, I'll, I'll mention it in the mall. The Feminine Mystique was a book written by Betty Friedan, and Betty Friedan would be, this would be the beginnings of the modern women's rights movement. It's, and she was a college graduate who did what every woman was supposed to do after she graduated, or if she was supposed to graduate. Most women were supposed to find husbands and get up and drop out of school. She got a degree, got married, happily married, had a family, but she started writing for magazines. And what she did is she interviewed graduates from her class back in 1946. And what she found out was all the women, or almost all of them, you know, they loved their families, but there was something missing. And that became the mystique. And the mystique is this, that women can be happy with only one option for success. To have a husband and be a good homemaker. That was the only option for success in the cult of domesticity. And Betty Friedan found out that no, they can't be. And she would eventually write this in a book saying, the feminine mystique, this idea that that's all women need is garbage. It's not true. It's not that women can't be uh, wives and mothers, but they also have the right to do other things, should have the right. And that would help trigger it. And Gloria Steinem would become one of her, essentially almost like a disciple, and then on her own would become a leader in the women's rights movement. And one thing she did is, is she tried to push this idea that women are more than just objects for men. And so she infiltrated the Playboy Club Back then, they would dress as bunnies, women would. Yeah, it's, I guess it's no different than that, like a hooter or something, the same kind of thing. I don't think much about 
bunch of groupings either, obviously, as you can tell. And she did that to prove that that's all women are, and that's that women deserve more. So no. Yeah, Venom the Seed's a big deal. It's a really good book. She's a, a good author. It's one of those I had to read, do for a class. And to be honest with you, I was like, yeah, you know, I agree with her. I do. But I didn't really want to read it because I'm a guy. You know, a man. And that was obviously stupid on my part. And I'm glad I read it. She is a really good author. It was really good. And then I remember my mom said, told you so. <laughs> she made it a loving way. Yes. Same page, Cuba, Castro, and Dana Pence. <laughs> oh, Cuba, Castro, just to remind you about that, Cuba and Castro, when Castro, <coughs> or Cuba, um, the, the tor dictator was overthrown, Batista, and Castro took power, Castro would be pretty soon branded as a communist because he wanted land reform, and he went, they got aid from the Soviet Union, and the Eisenhower administration tried to do like Guatemala, create a, a rebel army, but it wasn't ready until Kennedy became president. And so that was the Bay of Pigs, where this rebel army would attack Cuba. And so it happened under Kennedy, and it was a disastrous failure. And Kennedy took the blame, and this actually made the Cold War much worse, but it also terrified Castro. They're out to get me. And this would eventually lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis, directly. And also, Castro became a much more of a totalitarian dictator. Who knows if he would have been better? He did become an awful dictator, but you know, man, someone's trying to kill you. I have the same problem here. Yes, there's another one. <laughs> Any others? Are we ready? You want to go? You want me to tell you a little bit more about the 70s? Okay, 70s. Disco. John Travolta, Hell on Earth. <laughs> That's all I got to say. You can't tell me. So many bad things came out of the 70s. Why John Travolta? He's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Right? Anybody agree with me? Any, yeah. Everyone else? They're the enemy. Why don't you like John Travolta so much? Why do I? Why do you like you? Saturday Night Fever, Urban Cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> you say he's a bad actor, like Saturday Night Fever, <laughs> Disco, Urban Cowboy, Country Music. <laughs> if you like Disco or Country Music, who's to say what's good music, right? Who knows? Music is a personal thing, right? And everybody likes their own kind of music. Who's to say what's good music? Me! <laughs> Pulp Fiction? Yes. Yeah, that's a tough one. And if, in, fortunately, Samuel got it. <laughs> so, Cambodia. Who are the other three promotions of the podcast? Nixon. <laughs> Calhoun would be a good one. And even though he's a, he's a great quarterback, I did the bond, so I'll be trying to I actually talked to him on the phone. Very nice guy. <laughs> Why? He just called. <laughs> That's actually a true story. All right, so. <laughs> That's actually true. He wasn't calling me. I just happened to be sitting in an office. <laughs> okay, 1970. <laughs> 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 All right, so 1970. Nixon, when he began Vietnamization, he began to slowly but surely pull American troops out. This is part of Cambodia. He was pulling troops out, and his plan was to eventually pull all ground forces out and just bomb forever. That's basically Nixon's strategy in Vietnam. Well, to make sure it worked, in 1970, they did two things. First off, they began secretly bombing Cambodia to cut off the supply line, 
the Ho Chi Minh Trail from the north. Secret bombing. That would actually trigger a horrible civil war in Cambodia. And then, in 1970, U.S. and South Vietnamese forces invaded Cambodia. And what they thought they would do is knock out the main bases of the Viet Cong that are just outside the South Vietnamese border. Now, a couple of things out of this. First off, the invasion failed miserably. It didn't work. But secondly, all over the United States, right, or anti-war protests exploded. Absolutely exploded. Because, for the most part, because of the draft, the lottery, and pulling troops out, there was a, a feeling that the war's ending. The war's ending. Then all of a sudden it looked like it's escalating. And protests went everywhere. There's a huge one in the UN. Huge one. They, they uh, surrounded the uh, ROTC building and were going to burn it down. Yeah. And then a few people said, why? Good point. And then, <laughs> but at Kent State in Ohio, there was a series of protests and the National Guard were called out. Now the National Guard, because they weren't sent to the war, would be the place to go to get out of the draft. You join the National Guard, you don't go. So people with connections, money, power, they got their kids in the National Guard. And so there's a lot of resentment and the National Guard knew it. They were sent out there. Well, the protests were actually dying down at Kent State, but at noon on a Friday, it's what, May 4th, 1970. Noon? What happens at noon? It's the first day there's classes let out, and all the students came out. The first day they finally had classes after four days of protest, and they all kind of went out in the commons. And the National Guard panicked and opened fire. They wounded over 30 people, killed four. And then at Jackson State, same thing happened. And the, the state troopers, similar thing happened. State troopers and National Guard came and killed 25 people. But nobody really talks about Jackson State. Kent State became national news. Pictures of the body, a girl over the body, which I'll show you after the test, because it's such a that's a famous picture of the war. Why not Jackson State? What's that? It's a black school. Twenty-five. Yeah. Four. There were over hundred wounded in Jackson State too. Now, it's not to say what happened to Kent State is not horrible, but it's yeah. Was the reason that was so much worse? Yeah, they just they just opened. They didn't quit fighting. Yeah. It was awful. So, next, Rachel Carson would be the beginning of the modern environmental movement. And the reason I put that there is because Rachel Carlson, back in 1961, would write a book called Silent Spring. And Silent Spring, somebody might have heard of that book. And Silent Spring, where she warned about the dangers of herb herbicides, I mean, sorry, pesticides, especially the wonder pesticide called DDT. And DDT was not only carcinogenic, it was in um, birds would eat the insects that had it, and then when they would lay eggs, the eggs would be weakened and kind of could just kind of dissolve. And so she called it Silent Spring because if you keep using DDTs, there'll be no birds left. And that was the first real idea that this continuous progress and don't worry about it will it you know there's a lot of earth left <laughs> really hit home. That in 1968, uh, the Cuyahoga River in, in Cleveland caught fire for a week. When a river catches fire, <laughs> there's a pollution issue. I'm not kidding, it caught fire. It just smoldered for a week. The river. <laughs> was there oil in it or what? Just chemicals from all the factories along the river. What, what was the reaction? How did they put it out? Huh? How did they put it out? They just had to let it go. All you can do to put it out is put sand, but sand just sunk to the bottom and the chemicals will pop back up and the fans will start again. Yeah. Well, some people are like, not a big deal. <laughs> and if you make us, if you make us get, take the chemicals out, we'll lose business. You know? But in 1970 would be the first Earth Day. And Earth Day is not as big a deal as it was is, uh, today as it was then. 
because Earth Day was the first real worldwide environmental movement. Because now there's a lot of the equivalent of that. And the environmental movement has changed dramatically. Even though I don't know, it's still I got a weird situation. And the part of the Great Society, the first Clean Air and Clean Water Acts would be passed. And these were shockingly successful. They finally would get rid of acid rain. Acid rain was a fun one. It would literally rain acid from all the coal powered coal fired uh, power plants. As, at, high, um, sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid raining down upon you, it would have made practice fun. That's actually true. It would rain down. And for example, the southern part of, of Lake Michigan was dead. Dead. It was a foam on top. It was dead. And now it's alive again. Same with the Hudson Bay. Okay, you don't want to eat fish out of Hudson. I'm not Hudson River. You don't want to eat the fish, but at least now they're fish. <laughs> Three heads. Yes. <laughs> And then Nixon, actually he thought this would lessen the environmental movement because Nixon was not a fan of it, would sign the bill creating the Environmental Protection Agency. And for the first time, the federal government will actively regulate pollution of all sorts and have an agency to do it. The Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act didn't have a way to enforce it. The EPA would. Now, Nixon, who was mostly conservative, would write this. But this is a liberal program, the EPA. Conservatives hate the EPA and always talk about abolishing. In fact, I just heard who's just ran for president, the neurosurgeon. Oh, ben Carson. Uh, Let's get rid of it. I just said, what's the justification for that? It's creating business. Wow. He's business. never had any political experience. Okay, so, me <laughs> lost. You have a question? Yeah. What? No, I don't. <laughs> he said it won't be signed. Yes. It's time for your surgeon, Mr. President, Mr. President. I can say with absolute certainty that he will not get the Republican nomination. Yeah. I will bet any amount. In fact, the people that will say that was so he's, Yeah, so he's not going to be president. What if? What if he'd be Mr. President? Because that's what Washington did. Washington was Mr. President, that's the precedent. So Hillary Clinton will be Ms. President. She's elected. She, I think, has a very good shot. No, she's Ms. Okay, so she doesn't want to be. I mean, whatever, you know, so her title, she wants to be. So what's Putin's title going to be? Now, that I don't know. Because first day, we just literally made up for lemonade, Lucy Hayes. Governor B. Hayes' wife, they just cut, they were mockingly called her the first lady. So I don't know what it's gonna be. Maybe it'd be the first consort. That's what they call the uh, the husband of the Queen of England. The first consort. <laughs> Which actually is kind of a creepy thing. You know anything about the meaning of that? So let's get back to this. This isn't government class. <laughs> Huh? He's still always going to be Mr. President. So actually, that is still good. You're right on that one. So if there's another thing happens in the government, he's always, once you're president, you're always Mr. President. So far, they're all in this. In 1968, in 1968, about a, no, no, it's me live. It's me live. It looks like my lay, but it's pronounced me live. In 1968, about a month after Tet, about a month after Tet, units of the American Division, so American soldiers, were patrolling. And this was probably the worst division in the Army. And they had been fired upon a number of times. They'd lost men. They wanted revenge. They came across the village of Milan. And we don't know where the orders came from. Almost certainly, probably from above, but they're, the guys above are going to get caught. They were ordered. This camp was eight. This city, this village was aiding the Viet Cong. Kill them all, and they proceeded to. American soldiers massacred between two hundred and three hundred civilians, men, women, and children. Most of them they mowed down, and their bodies laid in the little canals along the rice paddies. Mowed them down. A few escaped. Now, gotta remember something. They're just furious and angry and want revenge. 
and everybody seemed like the enemy. Well, the army did everything they could to cover this up. And by the way, this happened a lot. At least over 100 times on smaller levels. Over 250 American soldiers would be indicted by the US for war crimes such as this. About 100 would be court martialed. You get people in these kind of situations. I'm not justifying the action, but literally they just they can't take it anymore. And they just they want revenge. It's awful. That's why these wars are so are the worst. Just the worst. Yeah. So if you're given the orders to like kill those people, would you have to technically do that? Technically, like, no. You're not supposed to follow immoral orders. Okay. But you get a combination of you're trained to follow orders. Yeah. Combined with, they just want revenge. Well, the army tried to cover it up for about a year. And then, at the end of 69, going into 1970, Mili came out. Along with all these other instances, bombing of cities, I mean, so many civilians have died, so many more civilians than soldiers, which is where modern war is. And this really became a huge issue, because the lieutenant in charge of Mili was a man by the name of William Collins. C-A-L-L-E-Y. And he is going to be court-martialed and convicted. He probably just was following an order from above, but he's the scapegoat. He's still alive. He doesn't talk about it. And he went into prison. And the big thing why this is so important, this became an issue of, are you a patriot or not? There were a lot of people who wanted, wanted out of the war and said, Look, this is what's doing to what American soldiers have become. Good Americans leave, and this war turns them into this. We gotta get out of the war. We gotta quit this. And then you have people saying, you're against them because you're not a real American. And you would not believe that would happen. There'd be fist fights over Cali, fighting in the streets with pro-war people and anti-war people, absolutely furious. The most famous would happen right after Kent State and Lieutenant Cali. It was called the Hard Hat Lions. Where in New York City, a bunch of guys, construction workers, came out there with their put their hard hats on and they got wrenches and things and waded in and beat the hell out of anti-war protests. One with an American flag. And the cops just sat there and cheered them on. Boy, the country got crazy. Nixon pardoned Cowley. And it became a symbol of patriotism. He's a real American. It got weird. Yeah. Huh? He went to jail. He was in jail, and Nixon then pardoned him and let him out. The hard hat riots were something else. Next, the Pentagon Papers. I should go. I'll go faster. I'm sorry. There's so many little stories about this. How much longer do you want me to go? A little bit longer. <laughs> How about I do? Here's what I'm going to do. I'll do down to the pill. Sound good? <laughs> pill Sanger. All right, so let's do it real quick. The Pentagon Papers were a secret history of the Vietnam War. It actually ended in 1968, but they were released. They were stolen by a Pentagon worker who actually was, became anti war. His name was Daniel Ells Ellsberg, E L L S B E R G. And he gave the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. Nixon freaked out. Even though he wasn't president yet, he hated this idea of leaks and didn't trust the press. And he tried to get the New York Times to stop putting it, but the Supreme Court said they could print the Pentagon Papers. Yes. They were a secret history of the Vietnam War. And the big thing was it showed all the lies that the United States told to get into the war. And that's why Nixon was mad. Nixon would create a secret group that would stop leaks. A bunch of old FBI agents who have been kicked out and CIA agents called the Who Stops Leaks? Watergate or Plumbers. Watergate's a hotel. Good guess. They're plumbers. All right. 1970s. Yeah. Were there a Yeah, there were a lot. But a lot of them were civil servants and they couldn't say anything. All right, so 1970s. 
the beginning of the modern feminist movement. And Betty Friedan created the National Organization of Women, or NOW. And their big goal was equal opportunity in education and equal opportunity in employment. Because women made about half of what men made for comparable jobs. And women were simply denied higher education. Just denied. Women did not take upper level classes, especially in math and science. Just women weren't allowed. It just didn't happen. Which is kind of weird because you go today and women make up the most of honors classes in high school and college. I'm going to get stupid. Yeah, it's just pure unadulterated relationship. Yeah, <laughs> National Organization of Women. And that would have triggered the modern feminist movement. Now, many of the anti feminists would come out and say that the feminist movement are basically people, who, women who hate men and want to destroy marriages. Which, of course, and, and Bob and Bra Burners, that's another very famous one, which, of course, no, that isn't quite at all. 1969, some of the now protested the, the uh, Miss, Miss America patch. And they said that you know, you're just, you know, women are just out there in bikinis uh, and they're being poked and prodded. Literally, that's what they did to check. It was, yeah, like a hunk of meat. And so, as part of the protest, they brought bras that were kind of like, um, like lingerie and they burnt them. And it became that they took off their bras and ran around. No, that's not at all what happened. <laughs> but they tried to say that. But we'll get more to that. And then, so that's the beginning of it. And the big, there were a couple big things they wanted. The first one was the Equal Rights Amendment. Oh, no, I forgot one. Add one to feminism, Title IX. One of the most important parts was the Title IX of the Education Act of 1971. And Title IX said no discrimination based upon sex. One of the most important uh, civil rights acts since the, since the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And what I mean by that is women cannot be denied the same opportunity as men. Now, most people think of Title IX and think of sports because there were basically no female sports before 1972. If there were, it was like a club. In fact, the only women's activities, and there's nothing wrong with this, but this is their choices. There would be cheerleading, some kind of dance, or bank, which is great, but that's it. Nothing else. No. And anything like that, would there be a track or a basketball? Well, it was not an organized sport. All right, so that set it up for, you know, I can still remember when I first started teaching here, even, girls' basketball was in the fall. Yeah. So it, wouldn't in, so it wouldn't get in the way of men's. So girls was in the fall, and there was no volleyball. It, or it literally just started. That kind of thing. So, ERA. The other big one was Equal Rights Amendment. And that was the redress the, redress the problem of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment didn't guarantee rights. The Equal Rights Amendment would say no discrimination based upon sex. That's it. That's the entire amendment. No amendment or no discrimination based upon sex. And it looked like it was going to pass really easily. Montana was one of the first states to ratify it, and they had very quickly over 30 states. Really quick, but they needed 36 or 37. And so, then it got to be a fight, mostly southern states. And then the fight began. And what happened is a significant number of women came out against the Equal Rights Amendment. And they were led by a woman by the name of Phyllis Schlafly, who I found this fascinating. This very strong, independent woman came out against equal rights. I find that fascinating. A lot of people thought this was kind of a contradiction. And what it turned into, the Equal Rights Amendment then turned into, and literally they called it this, a cat fight, which is already kind of a chauvinistic term of two just women fighting. They can't even agree on their own. And then the arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment, that worked. It worked so well that it failed, were this. First off, women, if they had equal rights, would immediately divorce their husbands and abandon their family. Obviously, right? Next, all women will become lesbians. 
next. And we know, you know, obviously that's true because Montana has those words in its state constitution written in 1971. And I don't know anybody in Montana that's, you know anybody that's married to them? <laughs> Except for me, I guess for over 20 years. Other than that, that's it. No, that's true, that's true. They're gonna leave their husband and become lesbians. And what's number three? This is the big one. There'll be no more men's bathrooms and women's bathrooms. Yeah, there'll just be bathroom. So can you imagine your little daughter going to the bathroom and some biker with chains comes in? <laughs> Think about it. Society falls apart. Fortunately, that did not pass, and there's nothing at all like that today. So. <laughs> All you had to do was scare enough people to vote against it. It failed. And this became the Republicans at first were relatively for it, and then the Republican Party went completely 100% against the Equal Rights Amendment, and it didn't have enough to pass. And I guarantee it today, it would not even get a vote in Congress to go to the states. Wouldn't even get a vote. They wouldn't let it happen. They wouldn't even let it vote. Yeah. Why did um, Schlafly argue against it? Schlafly believed that a woman's place was in the home. And if women have equal rights, they will abandon, they will lose what the true role of women are, being good mothers and housekeepers. Now, this is a woman that was never home because she didn't spend her entire time fighting against the ERA. I'm not kidding. <laughs> her husband actually be raised to her. I think it's kind of funny in a weird way. She's still very active. She's in her 80s. Yeah. Why would he get a vote? Republicans wouldn't allow it. Republicans would not allow a vote to them. Not it wouldn't get a vote. In fact, Montana's le Montana state legislature would vote to take away rights from women. They could get rid of that. And you know what that's coming through. All right. Last thing, the pill. The pill, the birth control pill, that would come into large use in 1961. <laughs> the pill. And Margaret Sanger, who started Planned Parenthood in the 1920s, would spend her entire life trying to come up with a solution for the issue of birth control, a pill that women could take. And this would become arguably the most important issue of the feminist movement. Because once women can control their own fertility, they can decide on their own when they'll have children. They'll no longer be totally dependent upon men. Because before, they are dependent upon men, and therefore, they have no choice but to, for example, get into relationships they don't want to be in, because they have to be married because they can't, because they have children, they got to be cared for. And I'll tell you one more reason for that in a sec. Yeah. Yeah, but that relies upon the man. We're not going to go into all the details of this operation, especially since we're filming this. <laughs> That's something you should ask your health teacher. I'll, I'll, Mr. Hageman will come down here. <laughs> there you go. Why, what a great place to end the review session. <laughs> but the point is this. Once with <laughs> Once women have this, then they can decide when they can have children. And therefore, they have more control over their lives. And therefore, more independence. And don't need men. And there's something else very important. Women, even if they would get a job in something other than the few jobs that were okay for women, elementary school teacher or secretary, if you job outside of that field, they would never get promoted. Why? Because they're just going to have a baby. Right? And what would they do? Just care for the baby. In fact, it was pretty common up to the early 1970s. The women got pregnant, boom, gone. Fine. Now it's legal. And so the pill is one of the most important issues for women's rights. It's no coincidence that more and more women were able to take jobs demand higher wages and demand promotion because they now have that control over themselves.
a big issue. And the other issue was abortion rights. Roe versus Wade was a court case winding up on whether or not women have the privacy right for abortion. And most states banned abortion. Every state had a different law. And this was really controversial. Nobody really cared about abortion. They, there, there's been attempts at abortion since there have been humans. You know, there's that, the way life is. You know, so if people think you get rid of abortion, they, they'll go away. Well, that would be totally opposite of what has happened since there's been humans. But what happened is you know, almost always the woman died. They died. So no one cared. I'm not kidding. The only time people started actively passing laws against abortion are when women started living. Yeah, there's a complicated history on this. It's very complex. But let's get back to this now. So by the 19, early, late 1960s, more and more women are saying there are abortions. It's happening. And first off, we have control of our own life. It's a right to privacy. Secondly, these abortions that were happening were illegal. They were dangerous. Women were dying of infection, were getting mutilated because they were literally done in alleys and garages. Or friendly doctors would say they needed an appendicitis and they would do that. That kind of thing to save their reputation sort of thing. And so, cases were winding their way up to the Supreme Court whether or not abortion was a privacy right. And in 1973 that happened. Roe versus Wade. And the court, Supreme Court ruled seven to two that women have absolute privacy rights for abortions for the first three months. They even gave it a name called the trimester that never was used until the, the ruling. But then after that, it got really convoluted. In the next three months, there can be some limitations, and the next three months, there could be even more limitations. But in the first three months, which about 98% of abortions happen to this day, in the first three months, and almost immediately, there's going to be an outcry against abortion. And this will be a big anti-feminist backlash. You have to go. Let me just finish it real quick. You can go. But anti-feminist backlash, partially for religious reasons, partially because, frankly, men didn't like the fact that they lost control. This is a issue of control. And there's another reason. Punishment. Women should be punished if they get pregnant and aren't prepared, and therefore they should have the baby. Because people say this all the time. Abortion should not be used as birth control, meaning it should be, there should be punishment. Which is kind of a fascinating thing. Because wait a minute, if somebody's so unprepared to be a mother, you want to punish them by making them a mother? Wow. <laughs> I just find it interesting. But it is a big issue. And by the way, if you want to have a fight with somebody that you would never win, argue about abortion. <laughs> but it fits in with a pill for economic rights. I hope that helps. I went through a lot. Yeah. Yeah. About a third of all women today don't live in it's not, I know you're saying. <laughs> I just thought it's like literally like you don't have it. You can buy it on your own. Now you get it, yeah. There's been talk about it. So it could happen. They really aren't sure. I read both, and to be honest with you, I think she's out of an incredibly good shot. Yeah, I agree. And who cares? Exactly. See you tomorrow. Yeah. At the Cuyahoga River burning, my grandfather was uh, living in that area. You're kidding me. Yeah, my family, part of my family's from Ohio. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, so the, yeah, they were near there when that happened. 
Do they know about it? Yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, you know, it was the news, but it was just like, everyone knew pollution was bad, but no one knew how bad. You know, it's kind of like, oh, it's bad, but it's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll fix it. It'll be easy to fix. Yeah. A river catching fire. I don't know which one I'm more scared of a river catching fire or a raining acid. Yeah, they're both pretty good. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See ya.